Okay, so I think uh, this is the right time to start. Hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise uh, webinar of the month. I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And as most of you, you know that Be Waste Wise is a non-profit organization and we are working around the principles of uh, dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for uh, knowledge dissemination on waste management since uh, 2013. Uh, we are very proud and happy to announce that this year we are celebrating our 10th anniversary and uh, we are celebrating a decade of uh, bridging the waste solutions expertise gap worldwide through various waste dialogues and discussions through this forum. We started off with one moderator in 2013 and now we have more than 12 moderators and we are among the best at what they do and they come from different parts of our world and society. Together they are posing uh, questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations that are more relevant to us than those in any other online or offline places. We have more than 300 contributors as well to take part in this journey. One such eminent uh, learned moderator we have with us is Dr. Professor uh, Do Dr. Uh, Brajesh Dube. Uh, professor Dube has been present is presently a professor at uh, for circular engineering at Department of Civil Engineering, and he's also a chair for School of Water Resources at IIT Kharagpur. Dr. Dube has more than 17 years of socially focused applied research experience within the broad fields of environmental, sustainable, resilient systems and circular economy approaches, addressing the nexus among sustainability, resiliency, infrastructure, waste, energy, health, etc., advocating the need of science-based policy. Dr. Dubey has been moderating our uh, webinars for more than, uh, you know, three, four years, and we are going to speak to two, and he's going to speak to two very learned experts from the industry, Dr. Uh, Prasad Modak. He holds a total experience of more than 40 years with uh, specialties in environmental policy, environmental assessment, ECG at financing institutions, business and sustainability, the circular economy, and capacity building in environmental management. Dr. Modak has wor worked with almost all key UN multilateral and bilateral development institutions in the world. Welcome, sir. And we have, on the other hand, Dr. Indumati Nambi. She is a professor at IIT Madras with demonstrated history of working in multiple areas of uh, environmental engineering, technology development in water, wastewater and waste treatment, resource recovery from industrial waste, sustainability and environmental impact assessment. She is the program coordinator of the Carbon Zero Challenge and Eco Technology and Entrepreneurial Contest. She has also served on central and state expert committees for advising the government on key decisions in the environment area. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Chetan Zaveri, the Vice President, Environment, ACOM India, will not be able to join the session due to personal reasons. But we proceed with this per eminent uh, panel and discuss today's topic on the role of academia in development of effective waste management infrastructure in India. We'll talk about the key initiatives that Academia can develop for the implementation and development of waste management in India, how successfully Academia is currently able to emphasize the adoption of sustainable solutions and technologies, and also how their influence can help in avoiding waste disposal in landfills through research and development awareness practices. Before we proceed further, I would like to inform all the attendees that this webinar is uh, being recorded and will be uploaded on Be Waste Wise uh, website and uh, YouTube channel. Please use the Q&A uh, function for your questions to the panel. And uh, if you have any opinions, if you have any discussion pointers or any pointers for uh, the panelists, you can uh, put that across in the chat function. So before, you know, before... Uh, you have any uh, feedback, uh, we would also request all the attendees to uh, use this time as much as possible to have much interaction with the panelists. So back to the topic in our learned panel, Professor Dube, uh, over to you. So thank you, thank you Akansha, and uh, thank you for everything you do to make this webinar uh, successful for us. Um, Again, welcome to all, uh, to all my Indians across the world. Happy Independence Day. We celebrated our Independence Day yesterday. And if you remember in 2014, uh, the government of India launches, uh, launched the Swachh Bharat mission. And as part of the Clean India mission uh, two, like Swachh Bharat SBM two, solid waste management is one of the core area of work. So as we get into the 10th year of Swachh Bharat mission, 
Uh, we I thought that this is a, a timely topic uh, to look at where we are in terms of waste management infrastructure in India and how the academia can help. Uh, in the, what the role the academia should play in making the effective waste management infrastructure uh, development in the country. And there are some success stories out there. And then, of course, we need to do a lot more, as uh, we all will possibly agree. So without getting into more uh, discussion from my side, we have to, as Akansha uh, introduced, we have two uh, distinguished panelists with us. Uh, so first, uh, I will request Professor Nambi, if you can share your experience in this domain. I know that you have been working with several industries, uh, several startups. Uh, trying to take the uh, work that we do in our lab and pilots to really making it happen on the ground. So how, what worked for you? What did not work? Say if somebody wants to do something, a new academic or someone like us uh, who is uh, trying to do that, take things from lab to field, what is your advice? Uh, what is your insight? So, so please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Brajesh and uh, Kangsha. Uh, I'm really humbled and honored to be here uh, along with distinguished people like Professor Modak and, of course, Brajesh is also uh, doing uh, a big name in solid waste management across not only the country, across the world. So uh, from my experience, if uh, I can say, uh, I think that academia, this is a problem, a humongous problem. Uh, we all know and acknowledge, uh, and it just can't be one uh, particular uh, uh, domain area expert's job to do it, or it cannot be an uh, a government's job to solve the problem or industry to take action. I, I feel this is something where we need to have a successful academia, industry, government, and also community uh, partnership to make it a success. Uh, so from the, uh, currently everybody is just working in silos, particularly I would say the government, industry, academia. Uh, we need to have a lot of interaction between these three uh, domains for the benefit of the people. Um, and actually academia is posed in the right, uh, we are posed in the very, uh, in the middle of all of these uh, domain partners, right? So people are interacting with us. The government is interacting with academia for certain reasons and industry is interacting with us. And of course, we are interacting with the society. Uh, so we are uniquely positioned to make this happen uh, uh, and make these people talk to each other. So I think uh, there is a lot academia can do. Um, in terms of, I think already we are all doing it. Uh, the government has academic people on their committees to make certain decisions, uh, to approve certain projects or to advise them on certain projects. I think that's one way in which academia can have a direct impact on the big decision making of the government, particularly in solid waste management uh, projects. And uh, the other major role academia already is playing is to sensitize the young minds, uh, inspire the young minds to think about these problems, these big challenges which we are facing uh, and motivate them to do, uh, take up research, take up projects uh, in uh, solid waste management. Uh, and it can be part of their PhD or masters or even outside of their PhD and masters. There is a lot we can bring to the table when we involve a lot of students and sensitize them uh, in these aspects. So uh, as uh, Akanksha had mentioned, Carbon Zero Challenge is one such initiative where we try to inspire young minds, uh, throw them these challenges and ask them to come up with solutions. And uh, not only uh, just innovations, but also uh, I feel solid waste management is a huge industry which are with a huge market which can be tapped. Okay, so academicians, the faculty along with the students should not stop with just innovating and technology development. Uh, they can go on to become startups 
uh, and now the government is facilitating so much of uh, entrepreneurship development in the country. So we should seize the moment uh, since there is a huge potential. Academicians can start looking at solid waste management as a, uh, a market. Uh, so technology can be taken to this market and we can have uh, in the India specific solutions because most of us know that we are when we think of technology, we try to import it and many times it fails. Um, and we don't have the machinery to uh, fix. And so that investment becomes just goes down the drain. So I think we need to have India centric in a way, indigenous technologies developed in India. Uh, there are lots of opportunities I see right from uh, even machinery for solid waste management, segregation, uh, shredding, heavy duty machinery, which is something which doesn't even need innovation. We need to have a, an industry for that in India. And the most advanced I would talk about is AI and robotics for solid waste management, which is already adopted in the Western countries. So there is a whole range of opportunities from basic mechanical machines to AI and robotics in solid waste management. So there's a lot of opportunity for young minds to work on these problems and come up with solutions which can become a very good business model. And eventually all this should be translated as solutions to solve our solid waste management problems on ground. I will stop here and maybe I'll add more to this later, Rajesh. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Professor Nambi for your initial comments, uh, opening remarks. Uh, so yeah, I have a couple of questions based on that, but we'll get it to, to that later. Probably we'll get the answer from Professor Modak already in his opening remarks. So let's uh, hear Professor Modak. As Akansha mentioned, uh, he has uh, more than four decades of experience. Uh, he is a mentor, a kind of a uh, mentor figure for all of us uh, working in this domain. It's always a pleasure to interacting with you, sir. So please, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, you know, when, when you told me I have some more extra minutes to speak, uh, I mean, the reason not so good, Chetan not feeling well, I thought I will show some slides, if that is okay with you. Is that okay if I could share some slides? Yeah, you can share your slides. We are, uh... Yeah, yeah. So that's what I thought I'll, I'll do and, you know, reflect uh, my uh, observations, what can we do as academia. Yeah? So let me look into my slide deck and let me know. Yeah, Bridget, can coming. you see? Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So what I will do is I will touch upon a few points from my side and Right now, Brajesh, I'm imagining as if I was a director of IIT Madras or a director of IIT Kratpur. And if I had all that uh, that kind of a position, what will I look at as a role of these uh, top institutions? And not just the top institutions. In fact, all the different academia that we have in our country, what can we all do to support the waste management infrastructure? So... Uh, this is a kind of a menu card for my presentation. I just have one slide for each. And as you know, Brajesh, my slides uh, are pictures, not not much text. So I'll manage in this uh, 10 minutes or so my, my presentation. The first thing I think we all have to do is understand the stakeholders in the waste management sector. Well, government is just one part of it, but then uh, there is a lot that we have to engage with the industry, uh, civil society, of course, and that includes uh, the uh, non-governmental organizations uh, and even deep down below the informal sector. And I'm, I would also distinguish the research and education into research institutions separately and higher education institutions uh, separately. And in the industry, again, not just the uh, the waste management itself, but the derivatives like energy 
and um, and also uh, those sectors which are responsible for waste generation they all had to somehow come together and we had to identify who these stakeholders are and once we do that i think we need to look at these stakeholders in the form of a of an ecosystem and understand the need to network so obviously in the waste management sector we do see it is a formal and informal sector as a, as a division which is blurring now quite a lot but there then we see these different stakeholders we talked about earlier uh, figuring out in this diagram with uh, interactions so some would collaborate uh, uh, there is also in some cases an issue in fact of lack of cooperation that we want to see and i would say that the whole canvas of not just the stakeholders and now in this slide the ecosystem the academia will have to figure out how do we position ourselves there to make this ecosystem stronger and we contribute wherever we can to make this uh, ecosystem function very well uh, and then also gives a very good appetite to our students to identify areas of research where someone is seeking a solution so first important is knowing the stakeholders and then understanding how they're networked and how they're interrelated and where the issues are right i would emphasize a a major shift the way we teach and i think we got to bring in the practice research component and deliver through flip method of learning if you want to make our academia more and more meaningful to the to the the point you said brijesh waste management infrastructure then our research and education and practice they all have to come in a force and we as professors should perhaps run our courses through flip method many of you know the flip method but those who don't know this is how we teach is we provide the content what we would otherwise speak in the classroom up front and now because of technology we make that content available virtually and the students are expected to read this and that's a big assumption of course but if they read all that and they come to the classroom all we discuss is the problem we do clarification we do some very exciting conversations and we keep bridging what they have learned into practice all the time this is a little difficult way and i i find when i used to be teaching in iit bombay and attempted flip method of learning and many of us in the evenings as faculty used to talk and we used to say there's a lot of sweat when you're doing flip method some people used to think oh it must be easy it's contrary do you have to do more work and i think this is where i think we as academia will have to get into a different methods of introducing the subject and i think that's where the beginning is that people understand the reality and what is being asked by that reality all the time and theory learning then has a purpose there's a meaning why we are learning that theory not for the sake of just theory so this is the practice research which i would say is very important that we have to bring into into our, uh, our our learning processes now this is a very interesting black hole term i call capacity building we know amount of inputs you give you never get anything back easily and it is many times equated to training programs but that's not what it is and therefore the academy apart from training uh, infusing learning processes building knowledge providing skills becoming a coach Uh, provide support in problem solving as well and then do some developmental work uh, maybe it's technology maybe it's management but some developmental activity so the understanding of capacity building in academia if you want to be responsive to what is being asked in building the waste management infrastructure i think we got to broaden that canvas and this is a subject which needs to be discussed and debated in the academia that how can we be really the capacity builder many government departments i'm sure brijesh and dubuti you will agree with me 
some of them are very interested, very keen, but they really need some coaching. They need to be mentored. And this is little different than running a one-day training program or a one week or even three weeks. This is more than that. And skilling, again, is extremely important that we all of us have to get engaged because this sector, particularly waste management sector, needs a lot of uh, skilling related support. So when we say infrastructure, here I want to expand, Rajesh, it can be both hard as well as soft infrastructure. And this slide is talking about the soft part of that infrastructure, and which is very, very important. Now, can a, a, a routine department, say of civil engineering, which has got a course on waste management be enough if we want to really out stretch out and meet the demands on the waste management subject as a whole and infrastructure as one of the elements. So we probably should see more centers of excellences in academia on waste to resource management. And these centers of excellences obviously will have to be networked. They can operate in a silo. So maybe there's a center of excellence only on electronic waste. There may be a center of excellence uh, on batteries, uh, very relevant today from the push on the EVs. So they could be thematic. And uh, some, I think, uh, Indumati, you mentioned, some could be on robotics in waste management, artificial intelligence applications in waste management. But the different components, as you see in this slide, which I put six of them there, uh, includes even the innovation and entrepreneurship hub, which which uh, in uh, Indomiti's your case, the Carbon Zero Challenge is doing it. Uh, so several areas here, and not to miss the intellectual property, which is also important to be addressed by the COE, because while we are emotional about the innovation part, there is also a practicality of holding the IPRs. And many times this item is uh, weak uh, and not so much so in the centers of excellences. So that's one expansion. But I think if we want to move in that direction, taking an entrepreneurial approach to education itself uh, is the key. Uh, so I like this picture because that's how the classroom should look like. And uh, you have people, somebody coming in as a guest faculty from the industry who talks about the realities, the problems, and something interesting happens from the, from the academic side into innovation ideas, uh, some of them untried, and then people work together, uh, you know, taking an entrepreneurial approach. I think that's the key. Given the opportunities uh, in the waste management sector and the, and the scale of challenge that we will soon be facing a decade later, uh, I mean, thanks to our great consumption patterns the way they have, and more and more urbanization, what we see, and more and more renovation, which we may be doing, sputing literally billions of tons of the construction and demolition waste all over the world, if you look at the global scale. And, and a country like us, which is in the pathway of rapid infrastructure development, it is going to see this metabolism of the wastes that we would have to deal with. So that's, again, important that more and more entrepreneurship is something which we have to bring in. So even the education, the way it is getting delivered may have to change. And that's the important point, that when we are in that mode, then, then getting the alumni involved more and more, and that is happening today, sometimes only to secure funds from alumni. But I'm here talking not just the funds, but not at least sharing money, but sharing the wisdom and the experience. So that's what I said, that alumni, once you bring in there, then you are bridging between what you discuss in the classrooms and what's your alumina doing outside? And that's the power of the academia that we have to we have to use. If you take it beyond the university campus and build around the university campus something innovative, very forceful, very dynamic, very, very vibrant, then we are talking about innovation districts. I don't think, Rajesh, we have in our country innovation districts as such. And imagine if we were to think about zero waste innovation, innovation districts, then it makes even a lot of very interesting, uh, very interesting opportunity, a great apparatus uh, that 
in order to make that zero waste innovation district, how much innovation we still have to do. And uh, that's something which is being picked up in so many countries across the world. But uh, I, would, I would have thought of innovation district on circularity as something so powerful, which intersects even to decarbonization. So waste becomes just one element, but it, it goes into circularity, rises even beyond that to decarbonization, our rate zero goals. So I am always wondering why we don't have such efforts. We have research parks, but that's different. And innovation district is, is different. So that's something I would say academia could start talking to the government, to the industry partners to create such districts. And in that process, we got to keep moving upstream, right? So imagine the waste management is subject is taught to electrical engineers, to chemical engineers, to material science engineers. Every branch that we teach in the university has a course on waste management. It's not offered by civil engineering or environmental engineering programs. Of course, they will offer. But we should definitely look for introducing waste stream specific courses in these departments, right? And that makes a huge difference. When you, and th those courses will also be delivered differently because they will take it the subject to upstream and not just on the downstream. And then the whole idea of uh, integration, and, and you have, of course, you, you told me just now, Brajesh, you run a course on NPTEL on integrated waste management. I think this is very important. And building the library of materials is the key here. That how can we use more and more you know, secondary raw materials for which you need a library? And remember, this is such an exciting subject where people are the pillars of the waste management infrastructure. And we also need to look at behavioral change. That means we, in academia, we have to introduce such courses on the wasteless societies we talk about, right? It's not going to be overnight. It's a behavioral change. It may have even a cultural anchor where we go back to our traditions, but somebody has to do it. And that's important to be introduced. And therefore, we elevate further to talk about inclusive circularity where we build in informal sector as one of our important stakeholders. And you and you, you are business models that how can we improve further on the entrepreneurship. And then these topics like reverse logistics, traceability, alternate materials, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. They get embedded. As, as, we, as I said earlier, we keep moving upstream and we keep on expanding our canvas. On the last point, we always don't talk much about it. And now that we know the, the climate change, what it can do in terms of disruption to our infrastructure, uh, I don't see much work being done in our country. And how do you teach management of waste post-disasters? And I think this is completely missing. What is the role of the academia, therefore, is to be ready with those frontier topics and get more and more prepared as an ecosystem, again, going back, that we look at the eventualities of facing disasters and what do we do with the waste that we have to deal with post the disaster. Three interesting stories to end. Some 15 years back, I was sitting in the office of Commissioner of Pune and we realized in our conversation that there were three universities offering courses on environmental science and engineering in Pune. And there were 60 master students in Dumati from each, so 180 students passing out. And uh, after some more probing, we figured out that all what was happening, and this is a very, very sweeping statement I'm making, but we found much of those 180 dissertations were inconsequential research. A good amount of time and effort put by the students, but there was nothing closer to any problem solving. So I remember that we organized a meet between industry and the academia and the corporation, and they identified the pressing problems. In other words, the topics for those 
180 dissertations, and some of them were put in groups. And in a year, Rajesh, we could see the engagement, power of that engagement in coming up with solutions. I did that for three years, and later on, I couldn't, couldn't have been doing my lifetime, so I left, but then it stopped. But you need, you need such kinds of approaches, and I was very happy, as I said in this slide, to push more consequential research. And in that, jobs, partnerships, and also industry appreciating the power of the academia. The second was a course which I was running uh, in Bosch U in St. Louis, where the students were given projects to green the campus. And they built these project ideas, which were supported by the alumni to make the campus green. And those ideas, which were, were amazing, were taken up as an entrepreneurship opportunity. So the students, through projects, were making the campus green. The alumni was getting a satisfaction. They were doing something for their own campus. And we built innovations and entrepreneurs in that process. I made Indumati a proposal for 11 universities in South India to do the same thing, but I failed. So if you, if anybody, any one of you have money uh, to spare for me, I would like to jump into, <laughs> jump into this project. It's amazing because we also coach the faculty how to teach sustainability differently while on the Washington campus. And the last I have taken purposely because you and I, uh, Rajesh, visited yeah. this campus together, the Tonli Innovation District near Adelaide. And I use this word that what we saw there was this partial and thought integration between business and academia. And that's the reason I flagged the slide on innovation districts. So to end, therefore, this presentation, while we see one side waste management and we see another big topic of materials management, I think the time has come that we realize they are equal. And I think we should replace this word waste management into material management. I think waste is too outdated a term to be used in that context, right? So thank you. I think I really exploited my extra time and crossed my 10 minutes maybe, but maybe this is useful for people to ask more questions and through those questions, I will learn. So thank you very much uh, once again, Rajesh, for uh, this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Modak. Um... Uh, for uh, your uh, initial comment and very nice presentation. So the way we will walk now is we'll uh, start looking at the questions and in between some of the questions that possibly we had among ourselves, we can also try to get that answered then, then too. Uh, so let's start with a question. Uh, with... Yeah, sure, sure, Professor Yeah, yeah please go ahead. to follow up on uh, Professor Modak's uh, remarks. Yeah, as much as we would want to work with the industry. Um, that I, from my experience, I've seen that industry is not quite open to share their problems for various reasons. So we have tried and uh, multiple times and, in, uh, and there has been some success, but I think that should change. Uh, industry when should sit across the table with academia, with government, and government should obviously facilitate this uh, so that we can come to a common ground and we can start working on their problems. Uh, so I, the government has a big role to play in this. And all of us know the reasons why industry is hesitating to even share even the smallest of their problems across, across to academia. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, points well token. Actually, uh, what I have once I have a, what I based on my interaction with the industry people, there is a trust deficit I see on the both the side. Uh, there is a trust Absolutely. deficit there, industry. In fact, uh, there is one comment or maybe a question as well, Mr. Sudhir Shukla. He has said that, don't you think that quality of research is still a problem in Indian Higher Education Institute? So that's where uh, the trust is not there. They feel that we don't do good quality research uh, for uh, to come up with a solution. Of course, he's, rank, he's linking it to the ranking, but I would not worry too much about the ranking. Ranking is a game, actually. Uh, uh, Mr. Sukla, you should not worry too much about ranking. 
Uh, I have seen some universities not rank very well, but still do very good research. And other universities, yes. which is actually ranked quite well, but doesn't do good research. So don't, we should not, uh, that's a different discussion, probably on another panel discussion. But I do, we do get the point that uh, people are there who don't trust uh, that uh, we are, we will be able to uh, produce good quality research, which will be useful for the industry. Many people think that we are only doing for our papers, only for the PhD thesis. So along that line, Professor Nambi, there is a question which kind of I thought that you can definitely answer uh, because you are working with industries along that line. Uh, there's a question from Vanita Prashad, and she has asked that how we as a startup can collaborate with academic institution to solve some real problems as jointly working with PhD scholars. And I know that you are already working something like that. So if you can elaborate on that, I think that would be useful. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, yes, startups, as I told you, there is a huge opportunity currently. And uh, we need to have these networking sessions. No? Academia is very good in doing uh, research and coming up with technology, but they don't have the wherewithal to build a business around it. Okay, So this is where we should bring entrepreneurs and academia together. And you bring the problem to us. You know the market. You would have assessed the market. And uh, so you can take the technology forward. Of course, there will be a lot of uh, arrangements we have to do, either license the technology or be a part of the startup. You know, there are a lot of models which are emerging now. Even in IIT, we have a lot of models. Faculty themselves becoming founders or co-founders. Um, and students also becoming co-founders. So there are, there is, the opportunities are wide open and this is the right time uh, because one person cannot do it all. Definitely the academician and the researchers cannot build a business you know, when uh, they are doing ac still in academia. Okay, so there is a great opportunity. Uh, there are entrepreneurs out there uh, who are looking for technology solutions. They've already studied the customer the discovery part is over and you know the customer's pain points come to us uh, reach out to academic academicians for solving these pain points and together we can build the business in that direction yeah i hope i answered it yeah i think so yeah and uh, that's another thing uh, which uh, i think was an number you were uh, referring to earlier as well in terms of where the funding is going to come from, like for everything that we need to do, there has to be a funding. So, Professor Modak, uh, as you are uh, globally, you, have, you know the system around the world. See, we have those uh, small business innovation research, SBIR kind of program, which really some people say that that actually built the U.S. industry after the Second World War. And that has been going on for several decades there. Similar program is there in Canada and other, other countries as well. Uh, why we don't have, uh, and you talk to several policymakers in India too, so why we don't have that kind of program where the industry can put a little bit of money and then the government puts like three times or four times of that, and then we work on a problem which is relevant for industry, which can create job and provide solutions. Yeah, so I agree. How to make that so happen? We, yeah, so we have either one possibility where we write grant proposals, right? With, for example, the ministries or the Department of Science and Technology, and people do win uh, what we call them as a sponsored research and development projects. So that's that's one way funding comes. Then the second comes independently, like a consulting uh, project coming from the industry, which which brings in some funds. And some industries do give a pretty long term consultancy assignments, and that that helps also. Uh, for even a PhD student to register on these little longer projects beyond three years, uh, that's a sec. But jointly, what you mentioned is in, uh, where there is a hybrid between co-financing between the government and the industry. Uh, that we don't generally see. The reason being that there are conditionalities of disclosure of the outcomes of the research, which the sponsoring industry may not be comfortable with. So if there are outcomes, then the industry would rather like to have it. And therefore, there are two silos of industry sponsored and the government sponsored. Uh, so that, that's one trend we see. There is also another very interesting point that many times, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really seen, and you correct me, Indumati, 
that there is a published department's research policy of next five years in our field. If I were, if I were to ask, say, the Department of Environmental Science and Engineering in IIT Bombay, which I was associated, I don't see a document which tell me, which will tell me in next five years, what is this department going to achieve? Any sponsor comes forward only when there is a clarity. And I'm not funding only for the sake of funding Professor Brajesh's project. And I don't know what's the departmental direction on that, right? So it's, it's like, a, like we ask the entrepreneur to make a business plan. I don't see published research plan of the departments where I as a sponsor have a comfort that tomorrow, even if Professor Brajesh Dubey leaves and takes a sabbatical, there is a Professor Indumati in the department because she's under the overall program of five years vision of that center on certain specific problems on the waste management. So that's also something, you know, Brajesh, we have to think about because many departments I've seen abroad who win sponsored projects, including from industry, are very organized and savvy in their communication to the outside world. And I may be wrong what I'm saying, but this is my observation that we don't have that kind of a situation. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I, I agree that, uh, see, when, when we write the DST, DBT, sometimes it becomes too sciencey kind of project and doesn't have the uh, app, app, like a application part that much because application part, we don't have the industry partner. And industry comes to us for consultancy projects uh, when they want a quick solution. And so it's not a research, actually. That's not an R&D. It's more of a try to fix one of their issue that they have at that particular point. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't take long-term uh, view of that. And many times yeah. they are after us when they get a letter from NGT or CPCP, that they, then they remember <laughs> us. That also happens. Uh, so that's, but what I was thinking that how to develop that research culture in the, within industry and academia. That's where uh, we have to uh, kind of work on. Uh, I can, can add to what Professor yeah, said. Uh, apart from these funding agencies, now the government has also started bringing industry into the fold of research. So there, is, there are programs like uh, UAY, Uchita Avishkar Yojana, Uchita Avishkar which Yojana, was yes. basically bringing the industry the sponsoring agency, the academia, all the three together and percentage of share for the R&D comes from the industry, problem comes from the industry. Those are excellent examples to emulate. And that and it just happened a one-time thing. I, I think it just was announced twice. These kind of things should continue. And uh, even there, uh, the facilitation was, although it was the first time probably they were, the facilitation was not great, but that was a big, big step forward. I see a, a public sector, uh, particularly the oil sector, has similar program like uh, CHT. They have, they are the organization which kind of relates the oil sector and the academia. And apart from that, I can see uh, the Indo-German Science and Technology Center, IGSTC. They have this two plus two program where they bring in one academia, one industry from India and one academia, one industry from Germany. That's again an excellent model where two core uh, groups can thrash out this problem or whatever challenge uh, they have taken up. And then they also fund for piloting these technologies uh, in India. So I think the government should make a note of all these success stories coming from these uh, uh, programs. Technology Development Board has been around for a while. So they, are, they are the ones which are taking the technology from academic level to the piloting level at the industry. I think DST has a waste management program, which is exactly uh, you know, uh, formulated to take technology to the piloting uh, scale. So there are, there are initiatives, but we need, I think this has to be like hundredfold. No, these initiatives are not enough. At least a hundredfold growth in funds, number of projects, and uh, bringing entrepreneurs, academia, industry should be the need of the art. Okay, so thank yes. you, Professor Nambi. Uh, there are uh, several questions already there. We have uh, we can go now 
So there is a, a couple of questions from Dr. Ravi Shankar Chila, uh, and he is asking on how the Institute of National Importance can hand handhold regional colleges for capacity building in West Domain, yeah, because that will, in his view, it will help to integrate rural and semi-urban local bodies and the institutions. So uh, what what can be done? Any thoughts on that, Professor Modak? Uh, uh, no, I think it's a very important suggestion. And in my experience, what I have done personally is uh, holding, I think we, I did about two or three weeks duration, three events, where we got professors from the regional engineering colleges and even local engineering colleges into one institution uh, for the purposes of uh, networking and training. And they were pretty good. We got good results because when they went back, they strengthened their teaching programs, the kinds of research projects that they would give. We also avoided some overlaps. You know, people didn't know that similar research is happening in another institution. So uh, I did those uh, three events. Uh, I'm sure they must be going on like this. And they didn't secure funding that time from the Ministry of Education, HRD, basically. HRD did give them a budget to hold such connects between the, um, you know, institute uh, like NIT or IIT calling people from the other colleges. Uh, it, it, I think they funded calling that as a refresher course. I remember, remember some name of this type. There was a scheme. And uh, about two to three weeks duration, these uh, faculty in the summers, they were typically courses offered in the summer. But maybe you know more, Indumati, how the current, uh, you know, between yeah. the, the universities, how are they connecting and working together to yes. build capacities? Yes, I think capacity building, uh, we have been doing for a while now for through our AICT programs. Uh, but I think uh, probably we need to move it up to the next stage where we can also help them um, build technologies, provide them the lab support, what they need, analytical support, what they need. Uh, again, um, we need to make these arrangements uh, into workable arrangements uh, so they can use the facility and go and do their work in that college. So. Yeah. I think the higher so, education institutions should open up the doors and establish right. like micro centers of research in different right. colleges. Uh, I see this happening through uh, one network which is already happening is the Unat Bharat Abhiyan program. So the regional coordinating institutes have participating institutes for those who are not familiar with it. You know, there, there are like under IIT Madras, there are 200 participating institutes in Tamil Nadu, uh, some most of them are engineering, and uh, they are supposed to go and work in the rural areas along with the students uh, in any of the development activities. Based is a big part of uh, these activities. So there is a network established. So although Unad Bharat Abhiyan doesn't provide that much fund, which is a big challenge, but the networking opportunity is a great. You no, know, IIT Madras has contact with 250 colleges around uh, uh, in Tamil Nadu. And these 250 colleges in turn have five villages under them. So it's a huge thousand uh, plus uh, villages we can reach if we have a technology and if we can somehow mobilize funds, that is the challenge. Uh, I think that's a good model again, but we can build on this model if the government uh, can give us support or I think now we have CSR, the other big support funding uh, which is coming from to our uh, academic uh, people is through CSR. That is a huge pool to tap. If you have the right project which is impactful, the uh, you, uh, corporates are willing to fund even up to 10 crores uh, for development projects in villages or urban centers. That is something which higher education institutes can tap into and then transfer it to the colleges which are working under them so that they can reach out to large number of uh, sections of the society through this network. Okay, so okay. thank you. So there's, there are a couple of questions on uh, the 
the curriculum. Uh, like, uh, as an academic, we teach, we do research, and we provide service. So in terms of curriculum, uh, there are Mamta Jain says saying that we should include uh, some like a circularity in our curriculum, and we should also teach our students uh, like how to do like a DFR and DFD and all that. And uh, then uh, uh, Mr. Antani is uh, requesting that we should include social aspect as well in the waste management courses. Uh, but then uh, again, Dr. Ravi Shankar Chila says that when the waste management being an elective course for the undergraduate students, so it's not a compulsory course even in IITs. Uh, as a, so, so there is a like a gap there. Like we're talking about educating people, but we are not giving due importance to the waste management course even in our undergraduate program in civil engineering or chemical engineering. So. Uh, I don't know, like we know the problem, Dr. Nambi. So, <laughs> I, so uh, in terms of some innovative ideas, if uh, somebody, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think definitely the new uh, thinking on circular economy, what Professor Modak was talking about, uh, should be part of the overall engineering curriculum, not only uh, civil or environmental engineering yeah. curriculum. It has to be like the ecology and engineering uh, course. Uh, ecology and environment course which is mandatory for all the engineering graduates i think uh, we need to have maybe integrate this part of that course or like in iit madras now we are thinking of uh, 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 an interdisciplinary uh, dual degree program or a master's program on sustainability so that will be bring in students from all the disciplines uh, to learn about sustainability and circular economy, which will touch upon like waste, water, energy, all aspects of circular economy. So I think at least uh, at the M-Tech level or at the uh, undergraduate level, we should offer electives first. And then um, it's up to the students to choose. I think things cannot be forced on individuals. Now that there is a realization by everybody, if we offer enough of these electives on LCA and circular economy, uh, ESG is another big thing which is being talked about in the industry. Uh, so we need to make our students industry ready, uh, not just teach the core courses of environmental engineering, but also make them address the needs of the industry. So definitely there is a need for new electives, new programs, interdisciplinary programs at both the under, like we can have a minor, we tried this. There can be a minor on sustainability and uh, resource uh, circularity, okay, which can be open to all the branches of uh, engineering. And then uh, of course, a master's level sustainability program, I think is now mandatory in all the engineering schools. It can be kept interdisciplinary. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, so there are a couple of questions from Mr. Subba Bangera, and uh, I'll just club all his questions together. Uh, he has a kind of comment that industry is far ahead of academia. Uh, they are already working on IoT and robotics and intelligent conveyors, uh, uh, but academics can help them in development of some sensors with that. And academia should understand the uh, the principle like pain points before trying any research. Then he also makes a comment later on saying that uh, MRAI, the Material Recycling Association of India, does have some connect with the industry and academia together. So, uh, so that's that's well taken. Uh, uh, so that's what uh, I think its point is like, yes, we yeah, we are not saying that academia will always be ahead of industry. That's what, uh, that's not, many times industry does uh, try a lot of new things, but if there is all there is still within that there is a room where academia and industry can work together because see that's where you will get your manpower tomorrow's manpower that you will need in your industry has to come from these from these universities from iits nits and other places so if they get exposed to this new technology if they work on some of these newer projects that's always going to help professor modak if you want to add something to that no uh, no all these points what he's saying is absolutely well taken there is one mechanism I remember, which is interesting, and in the way you might like to try this also, is a, all publicly financed waste management projects in China and in Korea. The monitoring of those plants is given to academia. 
Now, this is a very clever book. This leads to very objective, independent assessment of the technologies in operation. It, it builds a very good database. It also involves academia in addressing any troubleshooting. And uh, it also, in some sense, uh, it becomes an independent assessment, somebody looking at the plant objectively. And this is for publicly financed waste management projects. Just think about it. I think, Indubati, if this is possible, I think you can do it uh, with your connections. Yeah, if they are Double open line. to... No, no, it's a government finance. The chance in here, there's no option. This is a publicly financed project, mm. right? Not, I'm not talking about private uh, uh, sector project. Completely. I know, but uh, I, that is the that is the drawback I'm seeing in our uh, country. Even though it is a public project, publicly funded project, uh, there is a tendency to always put things under the carpet if things don't work well. So even the corporations and municipalities are not inviting even visits the, to a dump site. Is anybody, yeah. any corporation, municipality open to a visit unless, you know, if it is a senior yeah. academician who is contacting them and then they have all these kind of, you know, no videos, no photos, no updates on Facebook. I get all these conditions when I take my students to visit a dump site. So that is the big no, problem. Just, yeah, in our country. to bring it as a direction. This is not optional. It's like how what these countries have done is, yeah. Yeah, this is the yeah. direction. Has to yeah. be done that way, so it right. can be done. When 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 IFC or World Bank is uh, funding these projects, it should be as a clause. It has to be monitored uh, yeah. and reports to be. And to that's be a that's a very good connect between the project and the academia, mm. because uh, students also get a chance to learn, watch the operation, collect the data, right. mm. interpret. You can also set better benchmarks can give a feedback for future designs because it's a publicly owned infrastructure. And that is the argument. I think we have yeah. to lobby here. It, it will have to be lobbied. Then only it will happen. Yeah. Good. Uh, so there is a question from Viraj Joshi and kind of more of a comment. It says that uh, it's from Viraj from EMC. He said that if you can have a credit to credit system uh, where the students are taught waste management and they get some type of credit with their grades, and then they are in, incentivized by jobs in industries. So, so if, if the students know waste management, companies will get uh, companies will can claim the credit in terms of the students' knowledge, and in terms of plastic credits or carbon credits. So it's an interesting idea. <laughs> so any any thoughts on uh, that, Professor Modak? Uh, I think I should ask Viraj. He's right in the office. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> so. Yeah, like and continuing education credits, right? In US, yeah, something like that. Places, exactly. Exactly. Even industry people can get credits for their promotion. Yeah, yeah, I think everything has to be documented and made account accounted, you know, the time they spend. It's a good suggestion. Right. There is one point I will add here. Huh? Uh, yeah. See, what has happened over a period of time, the subject is vendor-driven. You'll agree with me that whatever theory you will teach to design an incinerator in the classroom, it never works that way. Yeah. So the fundamentals are getting redundant in education slowly. Mm -hmm. And you can just Google it all and read. Because the designs in the outside world are completely vendor-driven. We fail to realize that difference between academic education. So, for example, if I'm teaching sedimentation and I try to teach Stokes law, it's irrelevant in different way because no clarifier is designed on Stokes law. <laughs> right? I will use the overflow rate and my design chart of my clarifier and pick up the size. We have to realize as educators, the boundaries are changing. And that is a missing link between academy and the outside world. Ab socho, most of the waste treatment, thermal systems, no chance that we can teach what's outside in the classroom. Because we as professors, ourselves, we don't know. 
how the damn thing yeah. has happened here, which is a 50-year-old research in that industry. Mm -hmm. If I want to do a waste heat boiler, I can't teach what Thermax is doing, engineering there. It will never be in the classroom. So we got to one day decide what we want to teach in the classroom to make it meaningful. Because the generation has changed. Decades have changed. We are still teaching tuberculosis book, no? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not disregarding. All I'm saying is we should change. There has to be, I think there has to be some uh, common ground. No, the industry disregard many times, I mean, not talk, talking about Thermax or some big companies, but if you look at small players like wastewater treatment plant consultants or waste consultants, composting units, they completely disregard the theory and science. They just say, okay, put a tank, put everything, that's it, things will happen, right? And whereas we are at this extreme looking at science-based uh, solutions no so there has to be a common ground we look at what industry is doing and maybe correct their course of action using fundamentals of science True. And, so, and, yeah that's yeah. the reason Indeed, i'm saying that we need uh, publicly owned plants operate by monitored i'm not saying operate monitored by our students so they look at what's happening in the real world right and and, and sometimes i feel it has to be forced these yes. countries, of course, they could politically, so they mm -hmm. forced and, and the right. wealth of data got generated out of it. Yeah, and you're right. The concept of living labs and experiential learning is picking up fast yes. in India yes. also. This yes. is exactly what you're talking about. No, Take them to yes. a plant. Yes. My yes. solid waste management class has almost 10 plant visits. I take them to all kinds of places where solid waste management is happening, right? Biogas plant, composting plant, pyrolysis plant, dump site. So they learn, uh, but they're not, they don't have any hands-on uh, work to be done there. This is what you are suggesting. So not only yes. just go visit, but actually go and spend yes. enough time there and then yes. try to incorporate the theory there and then we can... Yeah, yeah. Uh, develop. I think it's, it's a learning both add, for yeah, the exactly. industry and for the yeah. students. I would yeah. even add that our internships had to be more meaningful. That students who have to do internship, we send them or give them opportunity to work in the right waste management companies. So those two, yeah. three months are again inspiring for them. So, you know, like you yeah. said, we, we have to sit together at the drawing board, you know, basically and see uh, our content of education onwards to the networking which we must do and somewhere you're right government has to come in and play some facilitating role yeah so yeah i totally like uh like in terms of our course curriculum as professor modak you were suggesting that we are still so Bangalore's book is still <laughs> is there because uh yeah, that's a uh, basic uh but yeah. there has to be a lot of practical aspect there in the course yes, as well yes. and then yes. as we and that practical, to bring that practical aspect, you need to work with the industry. Uh, otherwise, exactly. that will not come to your uh, the domain anyway. So yes, like yes. some of us who have been lucky, like I worked in the industry before and I had a chance to work with industries almost on a regular basis. It does help. Uh, but yes, uh, but otherwise many courses becomes too theoretical. And then it, so, yeah. so I, I have of the view that uh, like, in fact, uh, many times in my our faculty meeting, I say that we should open our course syllabus to the leading industrialists and let yeah. them look at it and give us feedback. Yeah. So we should be, academia should also be open to criticism. Yes. Say that's uh, that's where uh, we need to kind of, uh, it has to be there. Yeah. So a couple of questions are still left. We are uh, almost uh, one hour, but we'll take these questions. Uh, uh, Thriban Bist, uh, who is a PhD, I think he's almost finishing up his PhD at IIT Delhi. Uh, so he has a question that uh, how can we ease up transition from academics to industry, especially when the industry and waste management are not ready to pay uh, people from academics, especially PhDs. Like his basically question is, there is not much R&D happening in waste management sector for our uh, PhD graduates and not much industry jobs also for PhD graduates. Uh, uh, so what what you would suggest, Professor Modak, to somebody who is... It's very difficult. It's almost very difficult. Going there you know, sometimes there. I therefore feel why people get doctorate in philosophy. Because you become philosophical after you finish PhD. What is the next step that one can do? And you're right, there is less appetite for 
the taking people in R and D on waste management, those who have done PhD in waste management, and there is also even I would say even in consulting, we in in my case also I I I'm not able to figure out how can I uh, how can I really have a PhD person in waste management happy and you know really getting satisfied kind of work we do. So many times I do feel, find people either go to PDF route right. And then look for opportunities or they get into teaching profession. Uh, I think these seem to be those who are lucky ones who can get into industry uh, in the R&D, particularly on waste management. I think they will be the one most lucky uh, people to work. Because in consulting world, uh, not much uh, level of innovation comes in, you know, uh, for, for a PhD student to feel excited about. So I would say yes. I mean, there's no, there's no silver bullet for this. Yeah, my suggestion is to go and if people are not willing to give you a job, go and create your own startup. Yeah, I know it's not an easy thing to do, but um, yeah, I mean uh, that that should be looked at as a career choice. I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm increasingly seeing PhD students going to the startup uh, domain because not all we don't need we, we, we make so many PhDs not our academia is not enough to take all of them uh, as faculties you know? so we need to explore whereas as I told you in the beginning there's a huge market and this market is being uh, exploited by people who don't know the, the nuts and bolts of solid waste management you talk to you no know, any of these guys managing the solid waste in the cities, right? So there is a huge opportunity for you to lead a team under you and uh, take up. It can be a mundane thing. It may not be like very hi-fi things, what you did for your research. It may be as mundane as managing a composting facility. But your research and uh, intellect will help in accelerating composting. Right? That's a big difference to the composting industry when you're bringing it down from 60 days to maybe 15 days. Okay, so it's not that PhDs cannot do uh, things on ground. You just have to have the right mindset and uh, there is a huge opportunity. Okay, so there's like, uh, I think uh, a comment from just what was Nambi was suggesting uh, uh, Mr. Sesadri, he is a PhD working in, uh, well, his PhD pursuant in welding technology and working in R&D in the waste management. And he is enjoying your learning a lot of new things. So here, here you go. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good. Uh, so now uh, last uh, question is uh, from uh, Manoj Singh Sekhawat. Uh, he is asking that, uh, well, which is kind of, we know in when we discuss waste management, unfortunately, every person becomes an expert. He did not use the word, unfortunately, I added it there. In the last 15, 20 years, a lot of projects have been commissioned and failed to run. The reason for failure must be put together, which are available to all, so that we don't reinvent the wheel again. In India, a lot of thoughts and technologies, but no awareness on the citizen part. We must include waste management in a school and all that for a new generation, and in turn, they take it to their parents. So that's it. That's had been a problem. Like uh, we had, uh, uh, we had technologies which. Like I, I say that, say, I will give you a very simple example. We design our compost plant or waste to energy plant without even understanding the feed that it will get. We go to the houses, collect the waste sample, but in our collection system, organics are eaten up by the animals, uh, good calorific value taken away by the rack pickers. So what you have the waste at your treatment system is much different than what you actually sampled as part of your DPR. So. That problem, and there are a lot of other problems there too. So, but uh, Professor Modak, with your more than four decades of experience working off and on around the world, and this problem is there around the world as well. So, it what is, you would it. say that, uh, yeah, please. Uh, no, I mean, it, it is really what you're saying is a, is a problem. I mean, I mean, there's no easy, easy answer to that problem. It's found everywhere, absolutely. Yeah. Professor Modak. Nambi, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, the time is right uh, for solid waste management to take off you know, in a big way uh, in India. I mean, I see, I mean, I closely work with Tamil Nadu 
uh, or Chennai solid waste management programs. Uh, and I see a lot of positive development happening in integrated solid waste management uh, coming up with waste to energy. Uh, a lot of uh, things are happening. I think legacy waste are getting removed. And so everything like it's, it, the, so I, I look at it as a gold mine of opportunity for researchers looking at legacy waste, characterizing legacy waste and uh, know where these things can go because it's a new material research, right? We know about fresh materials, what to do with them. But these legacy waste are like semi-degraded materials of different nature, right? So uh, look at everything as an opportunity. There is an opportunity to do research. There is also opportunity to do translate this research into real world uh, problems. Okay, so I think uh, even the government is now looking at startups, uh, facilitating startups to come in as bidders. Uh, Tamil Nadu government has started it. Startup Tamil Nadu is doing it. Uh, so there are opportunities for youngsters to have their own businesses, and government is supporting them. Okay, so um, to look forward to see more such uh, startups coming because. Uh, we need people like you who have the basic knowledge and who can implement uh, technology on ground. So that is why many things are failing. What the other, uh, the last question was talking about failures of several projects. That's the reason yeah. Yeah. failures are happening. People without core knowledge, just jumping into the business for the money and through contacts, that has to stop. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, we are uh, getting uh, ahead of time. So just maybe, uh, uh, Mr. Professor Nambi, Mr. Sasadri wants your contact, so you can probably just uh, reply back to him on towards for the Q and A. Uh, okay. Or, or he can, or uh, Akancha can provide that contract as well. Uh, in terms of your email is available on Google. Uh, Mohit uh, Somani, who is uh, recently, actually, he did, uh, did recently PhD from IIT Delhi, and I was uh, his PhD examiner at that time. He has, he's presently working in Norway, and he has a suggestions that uh, our industry should be made mandatory to engage uh, at least 10 masters intern every each summer compulsorily. That is what he is saying in Norway, that uh, all the waste management industry has to have 10 uh, uh, interns uh, from the, it's compulsory, they have to have it. Then, uh, okay, so uh, Mamta Jain has a question for Professor Nambi that uh, it's a, whatever you're doing at IIT Madras is commendable, uh, but uh, we're working with the government as well as with GCC. Is this happening pan-India? Do you see similar things happening across India as well? So any comment? No. I think I think most of the IIT faculty, I think Brajesh would also know the answer for this. They are uh, pulled, uh, roped into committees uh, of the government when large decisions have to be taken. This is happening at least in the metropolitan cities across India. Okay, so the last, uh, there was a comment or common question from Komal Dhiwar that, uh, that how to get informal sector involved in our waste management activities, in our research, uh, like R&D activities as well. So uh, we do talk to them in terms of uh, some of the social aspect and all, how to make the life better for it, especially the newer research projects that they do. But Professor Modak, do you have any experience where uh, uh, like informal sector became part of a good research project? I would give a example of Swatch Cooperative in Pune. And uh, this is one example where a number of research publications came up with a lot of revealing data way back, something like 20 years back. And, uh, and that that was, a, to me, a great example how research, uh, I mean, in this case, uh, the person who did was a faculty uh, from a university and worked with Swatch and the uh, informal workers and picked up a wealth of data. But I think there, there were then many uh, subsequent similar such projects, not only with Swatch, Chintan is another example where, again, you do see involvement in Delhi of some of the academic uh, research uh, research professors working with Chintan. So there are now more and more examples. But uh, if you look at Swatch, their website, 
Uh, and then the, I think the publications got hosted on the website of waste.nl in Netherlands. Uh, you do see such kinds of uh, work published. GIZ has uh, published similar such work with partnership with academia in Latin American Caribbean countries. So there are some good publications there. Philippines is one another country where there has been a lot of work with University of Philippines and the informal sector in Makati. So yes, there are. But I would say to start with, start looking at Swatch in Pudi. Okay, so thank you. So we were almost at an hour and 10 minutes. And uh, so over to you, Akansha, you are mute. Akansha, you are on mute. Thank you. Thank you so much. We definitely gone beyond our time limit, but for sure, this discussion has been so fruitful for the attendees. And thank you so much for having so many comments. All the attendees have been giving so many comments and they have joined from different parts of the world. So thank you so much attendees for uh, joining in for this webinar and being part of this informative session. And uh, we wanted to thank all the panel, uh, the entire panel today for taking time out and sharing your knowledgeable uh, experience with all of us. As I mentioned uh, that this webinar is going to be recorded and will be available on WeWasteWise uh, webinar on website and YouTube channel. We request you all to also keep uh, a tap on the upcoming events and the webinar such discussions on our website and on our uh, social media and on our newsletter uh, you know updates uh, there are certain queries which were part in the chat section uh, we will be sharing that with the panel and make sure that all the queries are being answered as I mentioned and, and uh, Professor Dupe has also shared his LinkedIn profile on the chat uh, you all can connect to the panel uh, on their uh, personal uh, LinkedIn profiles and uh, if there is any questions unanswered, then you can con contact us. Uh, thank you again for taking time out and we hope to see you soon. Thank you all. Have a very good evening to you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you Akansha. Thank, thank you, Professor Modak. Thank you, Professor Nami. Yeah. Nice meeting you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.